Hey for the Wild community, Ayana here, and I wanted to share a few updates before we begin our conversation with Ron Finley. First, we are looking for land partners for the One Million Redwoods Project. So if you're a land steward and you are looking for redwoods, Don Redwood, Ponderosa Pine, Monterey Pine, Doug Fir, Grand Fir, Noble Fir, and some other beauties, please get in touch with us by emailing engage at forthewild.world. Also for the One Million Redwoods Project, we're building out our research team. So if you have a background in forestry or mycology, again, reach out to us at engageitforthewild.world. Lastly, we are opening up to sponsorships. So if you or your company would like to sponsor the podcast, again, reach out to us at engageitforthewild.world. All right, now on to the show. I want people to be self-sustaining. That's gangster to me. It's because being a gardener is one of the most gangster things you can do. Mother Nature is the ultimate gangster to me. The silence is broken by somebody crying, trying to be heard, never a word. Always the attitude, sort out your own. Always alone, wishing for something the world is denying. Out in the wilderness, somebody's crying. Somebody wishing for something to happen, wishing to tell, wishing to help. Someone was listening, someone who cared, never despaired. Someone to lean on and someone to trust. Who needs your assistance and finds your disgust? Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today we are speaking with Ron Finley. Ron is a creative phenomenon, a gangsta horticulturalist with a strong vision for community gardening and changing culture. Nicknamed the Gangsta Gardener, Ron Finley planted organic vegetables in the parkway in front of his South Los Angeles home and a revolution was started. Ron's belief that gardens build communities has blossomed into a quest to change how we eat. Today, Ron's mission is changing the composition of the soil and communities around the world through the Ron Finley Project. When he is not speaking, you can find him in the garden. Well, welcome, Ron. I really wish that we could be sharing this conversation with our hands in the soil in one of the gardens you tend. But that being said, I'm so delighted to have you on the show today. Hi, how are you? So recently, I've had the pleasure of being in dialogue with a number of vibrant farmers working for land liberation and food justice in their local communities. And one of the lessons that really rang true in my conversation with both Leah Penniman of Soulfire Farm in Grafton, New York, and Malik Yakini, hailing from Detroit, is that every community has their own needs and desires, and every community deserves to actualize their unique self-determined solutions so your home turf is South Central Los Angeles, and I'd like to begin by asking you to share how your work has evolved in relationship and dedication to your specific community. I consider the whole world my community. I don't set trip. You know, I'm accepting everybody who wants to turn this to change this design of what we're dealing with right now. Uh, so, no, I don't. It's not a specific thing. I mean, I, I literally travel around the world right now. I'm speaking to you in the middle of a park in Memphis, Tennessee. We all need the same thing, period. I don't care where you're at. We all need shelter. First and foremost, we all need air. It's the single most important thing to your life that nobody seems to think about because they figure it's here until you need it. To me, I don't, I don't treat this like that. I don't treat this like, oh, I'm over here and you're over there. No, it, we all as humans need the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. So many of us don't think about air or water even. At all. I'll ask the question, you know, around the world, from Denmark to Compton, California, and I'll ask, what's the single most important thing to your life? 
and people will say, oh, love, my kids, God, my husband, my wife, uh, you know, my cats, but nobody generally, 0. 0.0002 might say oxygen, air. So no, you know, you'll get water and you'll get food, but food and water is not the single most important thing to your life. First and foremost is air, because without that, you don't have anything. What I'm trying to do is just have people think about what we've been taught to value differently. The space that needs to be cultivated with me is the space between your two ears. That's what needs to be farmed. That's the soil that needs, <laughs> that needs to be tended to. That's the garden that needs to be raised, is that space between your ears. Because what we are living right now is something that it's not really designed for us. It's designed for us to be minions for corporations. Is it ever? And thinking about Los Angeles, <laughs> where your project started, I believe, you know, in LA is such a giant metropolis, and it's this nexus of money and privilege with the entertainment industry, but it's also heavily dependent on resources from elsewhere. And not only are right. these manicured lawns and consumptive lifestyles sucking the watersheds of California dry, but the city also owns 26 square miles of vacant lots, which is actually equivalent to 20 central parks. So to think that in the sphere, the city reprimanded you for utilizing open space to grow food for and beautify your community is absurd. So I'd love to hear the story of how your projects persevered through the many hurdles imposed by inequitable bureaucracy from the beginning of your gardens and the Bureau of Street Services citation to then the recent crowdfunding campaign that led you to the purchasing of your own land and property. It basically started because what I do is not necessarily, it's not about food. Food is a very small component to what I do. First and foremost, what I do is about people. And that's what people, <laughs> they, they, they take that for granted. Everything I do is about people. It's, it's, when you do things like this, what I've, the undertaking that I have, it's not about you. It's way, way, way bigger than anything you do. They weren't just going to reprimand me. I was going to get arrested. <laughs> you, a lot of times you have to step out of your comfort zone to, to show people the difference. And that's what happened with the city. I mean, I, I kind of embarrassed my city to like, well, you have these areas with the only land these people have is, a, is this land that's supposedly owned by you in front of their house. Why can't they grow food instead of putting grass there? instead of people leaving trash on your parkway. You know, and that's the thing with me. I didn't get a citation because people would leave toilets and dressers and couches on my street. But as soon as I put some agapanthas and some onions and carrots out there, all of a sudden I'm a criminal and I get a warrant for my arrest. So what this has led me to is, like I said, speaking all over the world on this. And I don't maintain farms. There's only one garden I maintain and it's mine. You should maintain your own garden because if you don't, you are still in the slavery system. And that's all of us. I'm not just talking about black people. All of us are enslaved by big ag, period. You know, you ask the child, where does apples come from? And they raise their hand and say, from the store, not from my front yard, not from my backyard. And this is all around the world. It's not just the United States. When I spoke to Malik Yakini a few weeks ago, he said something along the lines of, quote, local food tastes great, but it won't end white supremacy, end quote. And I thought about this when I read about your visions for the Ron Finley project and how your projects for a growing food into freedom. But it, like you were saying, it's more than that. And severing the lines of dependence and encouraging local autonomy and communal reciprocity. So could you tell us more about the goals and visions of the Ron Finley project? And then how is this initiative and your upcoming event the function invigorating revitalization within your community, but like you were saying, the global community. What we're trying to do is have people understand that the environment that you live in is by design and it's not designed for you. The fact that we all are designers and we are capable of designing the life we want to live and not the one that's been designed for us. So my whole thing is if we just get together and start communicating for one, but then if we grow together, we grow together, period. And that's, that's what I want people to realize, that 
if we get together and start growing our own food. So now you have neighbors growing food. So now you can trade food with each other. You don't have to grow all the food that you're going to eat. You can do it collectively. That's altering the system. And to me, gardens, they don't just represent food. They represent freedom. Freedom from just that food apartheid, food racism, food injustice, (laughs) because that's what it is. These areas that are so-called underserved, they're underserved. Why? Because they're underserved. That's the only reason. Why all of a sudden when the complexion of the community changes, there's cafes and fresh food and juice bars and coffee shops everywhere and everything's convenient. It's the same city. It's the same street. It's the same trees, the same storefronts, but all of a sudden the complexion changed. And I want people to realize all of this is by design. And I got to address a bunch of mayors like that. You know, it's like these underserved communities are underserved because you're not serving them until it benefits you. But and then people don't realize the billions of dollars that are being made from poverty or the delusion of poverty that we have companies, fast food companies, diabetes centers, these what are these drug stores in our neighborhoods that are making billions and billions of dollars off of people's suffering, off of people's misery. So if there's no money in these communities, how are they making all this money in these communities? How are the slumlords living in different parts of the community like Beverly Hills and Palace Verdes if there's no money in these communities? It's a delusion. Yeah, so you're saying that these... Uh, the, well, they sound mm-hmm. like I sh- you sound like I shook you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really... It touched me the way you explained it, how these slumlords living in these served communities, these communities of privilege, and they're making the money off communities that are said to have nothing, that are said to be in the, like you said, the illusion of poverty. So what you're saying is that the system keeps these communities impoverished, but they keep them impoverished because they're actually making money off of it. You're damn right. Being like that. Yeah, you got the diabetes center, they get a billion dollars in fines and they can pay it like with one swipe of a credit card. Yes, it's by design and no one sees it like that. When you look at the population like African-Americans, what are we, 13 percent in the world or something? So how we have the highest rates of every disease that there is? Is How is that possible? How are our numbers in prisons more than anybody else's? How is that possible? And we're the small, one of the smallest percentages in the United States of America. It's racist, and it's been racist. It has to change. When you go into these communities also, the rents are higher. The food is more expensive. And it's things like that. If we get a bank loan, we pay more percentages on the bank loan, if you're able to get one. All of this is designed to keep you in a certain place, and it's going to keep you unhealthy, and it's going to keep you in debt. All somebody has to do to see that is open their damn eyes. Opening your eyes to both parts, that one The system is designed to keep certain people sick and impoverished. On the flip side of that coin, the system is actually also making money off that being the case. It's a brilliant design. It's a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant design. It's just as brilliant as diamond cartels. That's a brilliant design that we need diamonds. Who benefits from that? Mm -hmm. Who benefits from you having a diamond? I tell people, like... You know, I ask these kids to go to school. What's the most important thing in life? Money. You know, it's like, wow. You know, and they think diamonds are worth something and they're not. We've been taught that they're worth something by brilliant marketing. I put it like this to them. I said, the zombie apocalypse goes down hard. Okay. It's on you. And you have carrots in your garden and you have carrots on your fingers. Which one has value? Real simple. Not the one that's been marketed to you has meaning if you have this, you're rich. You can't do nothing with a diamond (laughs) in a zombie apocalypse. (laughs) No. And I mean, the thing with diamonds, too, that I was learning is that there's actually this fake, not supply and demand, but... It is. It is. Right. They held them. They held them back. Exactly. They held them back to make people feel like they're more precious and that they're worth more. But it's yeah, that's a really good. um, That's a that's a great metaphor, whatever we want to call that. But, you know, I want to get back to this. Well, actually, in one of your TED talks, you spoke about how 
you weren't interested in living in someone else's manufactured reality. And it really reminded me of the concept of radical imagination, which I was introduced to by Adrian Marie Brown, who's a social justice and black liberation facilitator. And I really consider her to be one of the great teachers of this generation. And I want to read you a quote from my interview with her earlier this year. It says, quote, the idea that we are actually in an imagination battle. We are living inside someone else's imagination for what this world would look like, how it would work, how power would work inside of it, how we would be in relationship to resources. We are in this space. And if we are in an imagination that created these conservative, inhumane conditions, then we need to have a radical imagination that moves us through and out of them. We have to be able to see something beyond this moment and something about seeing it gives us something to orient towards, end quote. So I'm curious, does the concept of radical imagination resonate with you and the way you approach your work? No, it's not radical to me. (laughs) You know, they can call it radical because now we're living with their definitions. It's not what I do. I'll get called to colleges supposedly because I'm a critical thinking. I'm not no critical thinker. Thinking is critical, period. You know, the fact that you're that what we're living, somebody designed it and they didn't design it to benefit us. It's, it's real simple. And everybody that says they work in social justice and food justice and there's no such thing. It's called injustice. You work in food injustice. You work in social injustice. OK, and until you fix it, it can't be called social justice because it's not. People should use the right words. Words matter. And so when you say that, every time you say it, you should be letting somebody know, I'm trying to change this injustice. Not that it's already just, because it's not, and it's, it's never been. No, what I do in the scheme of things, because of what we've been taught, I guess you can call it radical. But how radical is it for somebody to grow their own food? Why is that radical all of a sudden? Okay, that's how screwed we are because we're supposed to let them supply our food. Oh, how are we gonna feed the world? We don't need you to feed us. Why don't you train us to build our own homes? Why don't you get us the training to grow our own food? You know, and that's where it needs to go back to. And every, what are they pushing to all these kids? Tech, 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 coders, tech. We don't need no more damn coders. We need people that know how to build infrastructure, know how to build buildings and toilets and roads. That's what we need. We're running out of these kind of laborers. Plumbers are making almost $200,000 a year now. That's where we need to go. We need to get off of this. Yeah, we need tech, but not to the point where you have infrastructures suffering. Are the tech community, are they going to go back to the wine country in in Napa and plant all the trees? Are they going to build the infrastructure back in in, uh, Puerto Rico? Are they going to go to Houston? They're going to... No, we need people that literally touch things and know how to build things. We need bricklayers that not only know how to lay bricks, they need to know how to make bricks. Who's training these people? It's really funny when just to hear you say growing food isn't radical. When did it become radical? Because we think just in the last hundred years, how much has changed? 
I think still in Russia, something like 90% of the country's food comes from people's gardens. It comes from people's small front right. yard. It's interesting how in some groups things have become radical because that is how screwed we are. It, it shows us that that's how far we've right. gotten from being healthy humans in their environment. And I am also, I really resonate with the tech issue because so, yes, I mean, children are being raised from babies on technology and it's all about getting these jobs in tech. And, and that's fine and well until something actually happens in the physical world. And then you're not going to be able right. just to code something on a computer to fix a bridge that goes out when you can't get home. Or, or what, what is a hammer? Which one of these things <laughs> is a hammer? You know, it's like that. And I mean, that's real. That's mm -hmm. real. Mm -hmm. You know, I got I got 26 year olds, 27 year olds around me that's never used the saw. And they think it's a miracle that you can take a pallet and make an anirondack chair out of it. A lot of what we do, a lot of what we advocate and teach is there is no trash. It's only art waiting to happen. It just depends what lens you look at it through. That's why I go back to say the field that needs to be cultivated is that space between your ears because we value what we've been trained to value and it's the things that they want us to value. We pledge allegiance to a flag. We don't pledge allegiance to your to your family, your neighbors, to life itself. To, we don't pledge allegiance to mother nature. Why why is this? So it's it's that. Well, I think about the way that you embody empowered creativity and then tangibly act upon these creative visions and dreams for abundance and care of the whole world. And it's really inspiring. I want to read a quote from you from an article titled The Renegade Gardener in Yes Magazine. And you write, I wanted to beautify my block and my first thought was smell. I wanted people to come by and smell lavender and jasmine. I wanted to just bombard people's senses with smell that's basically where it started end quote and so i'm intrigued to ask you how you see beauty or gardening as an art form as an antidote for the manufactured monotony and intentionally oppressive design of cities especially in certain neighborhoods and how tapping into the beauty the art the tangible senses how that just shifts the entire space. Well, it's like I said, it's amazing what a sunflower can do. It's almost difficult for people to walk and see a sunflower and not smile and not engage, especially when this sunflower might be 10 to 12, 14 feet high. Because people in the city, they've not been exposed to this. And it's, it does, it transforms people. To walk down the street and all of a sudden, you just smell beautiful smells. You see color. I mean, they know what color therapy does. You know, why, why are these elementary schools and why are they the colors? Why are they this bland beiges and grays? They already know, all the psychologists know what these do to your psyche. You know, you're in a fenced area. You're in a place with, with little windows you know, you're already confined. So a lot of times you look and it's like, wow, these kids, they're already in prison. So when they go to prison, it feels like normal. So it's like, but I have a real simple saying, it's beauty in, beauty out. If you put beauty into a space that has none, that's what you're going to get out of it. It's the same thing that you put into your body. If you put healthy, nutritious, vibrant, alive food in your body, that's what you're going to get instead of the dead things instead of the chemicals that we are putting into our bodies. And that's what I, my garden in front of my house is a, one of the biggest social experiments that you could do because it shows how all of a sudden people will see concrete and asphalt and, and trash. And then you see this, whoa, this is an almond tree. This is a banana tree in the middle of South Central on the street with fruiting bananas on it. It's amazing how people interact with this. I have people that literally go out of their way just to walk by my garden because as they know it changes constantly all these things are known i mean they got they have studies on all of this so, you know they know how gardens affect people when they're in prison how the um the these guys have a purpose now and and the violence goes down they have all of this they know all this so why don't we have gardens in every school 
in America, in the world? Why don't we have them in every prison on the planet? Why? Why don't you already know? I mean, you're and plus you're giving somebody a trade and a life skill. I mean, everywhere you far as I'm concerned, everybody on the planet needs to at least know how to grow food, just like we know how to breathe, just like we know how to walk. We should know how to grow food or at least where it comes from. We're in this world now that all you have to do is tap a button and they send you a box of food with with how much salt and pepper you should have and and how long you should cook it. And there's no effort. And to me, all of this stuff is making us deaf, dumb and blind because we're not using our intuition. We're not using our senses. Absolutely. And I think what you said at the beginning of our conversation, the space between the ears, how that space is being co-opted and controlled so that we do lose our senses, our sense of intuition, our sense of beauty, our sense of smell, our sense of color, all of these things that you've been bringing up. Again, it's by design and it it helps whoever we want, you know, corporate capitalism or however we want to call it, be able to have control over people as just being consumers to keep the system going, 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 going. When you think about it, you think about, OK, you have a child, right? He was given or she was given Similac, <laughs> which had too much estrogen in it to start with. First thing, you know, has a child, has an infant. Then they go to school. This might be the only meal they get all day. They might get two meals in school something for breakfast and something for lunch with this food ish. So their brain's not going to develop the way it's supposed to because they're not getting the nutrients that they need and their minds not, their body's not going to develop. But then you keep flashing all of this, these riches in front of them. And if you need this kind of car and you need this diamond and you need, and you should smoke and you should drink and you should do this. And it's like, okay, where am I getting the facility? Where am I getting the money to do all this? Where am I going to do this? So this kid, he he can't compete in school. Everybody, the whole college, that's another story with me. You know, you can't compete in life. You haven't been taught any knowledge. You've been educated, which means you've been indoctrinated. So what are you going to do? Because you need these things that they showed you that if you're a successful person, this is what you have. You have this. You're going to go to crime. And where are you going to wind up? You know, in a facility. And that's what's happening in these neighborhoods. I call these schools incubators to the prison industrial complex. Because what is a prison unless you have people in it? We need people in prison because look at how many industries prison supports. Think about it. Just do a deep dive in your head and think about how many industries incarceration supports from vehicles to clothing to bed linen to food to electronics to courthouses to bailiffs to judges. I can go on and on and on and on. Do you think they're going to stop that? You were touching on this earlier, but to dive deeper, how do you see urban nature and gardens and skills intersecting with the atmosphere of state violence in inner cities and the prison industrial complex? What we have to do is is let people know that it's, it's a setup and you don't even know it's a setup. You, <laughs> you're, you're right in it, but it is a setup. Every all the media that you hear, the ads, drink this, hey, drink. And you got athletes and you got entertainers sponsoring these sodas that, you know, they know cause diabetes and everything else. And if you're cool, you'll drink this. If you're cool, you'll do this. People have to have the knowledge of self to realize that they've been played. And they need to wake up. It's like with me. I, I tell people, I'm not, you know, people, oh, are you doing gardens here? Are you doing gardens there? I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not doing nobody's garden. Do your own damn garden. I was like, I'll help you, but I'm not to help. Because if you don't physically know how to do it yourself, you're still in the system. I want people to get out of the system. I want people to be self-sustaining. That's gangster to me. People wonder where that whole gangster gardener came from. It, it didn't come because I'm some ex-gangster or ex-gang member. No, it's because being a gardener is one of the most gangster things you can do. Mother Nature is the ultimate gangster to me. You know, so that's where that came from. Being self-sustaining, that's gangster. Uh, and that's what I want people to see. They don't know they're being manipulated. They fall in all these celebrities and rappers and, and you know, who's promoting being alcoholics. And you see a lot of them, they become alcoholics from what they were promoting. 
how much land was taken like that throughout history. How are we going to change that is just that. We have to change it with value of self. That's how it's going to change. Everything I do is going to be funky. Uh. Writing scriptures applies to the ones I idolize. Like there's a way to find a name and lie, but I'm just another brother with the name of rhyme. Some other spits and mutter in the name of that. The competition in scribes in. The battle in the torture, the pride, the wish I was a brother kind. To which be the guy that needs to be blind. To the weeds of flex inside, breathing easily. And all those beliefs that were recently mistaken by the feet. And where they're really leading me and being ropes in his feet. Decency, choking how I think Increasingly a host of things that needs to be addressed Within the complex of my polarized sets I smoke, I confess To all the moments I forget Stuck upon the crutches of the dumb sex While at home I find a met with everything I'm eating stroke and pets But truth be told I'm still coping with his death Oh shit I miss your dad, rest in peace, rest in peace Draw the curtain to so many, so observe Being treating them a sea like a sketchy merchant Lurking in the liminal between Skeptic and certain to extremes Further in with these from the clutches of these earnings So control the part the discipline was covered Aim at the beat, preserve the peace of me Within the digital and furry feet is turning Swerving from a piece Blinded by the song of what it really means Speaking like the growth goes the deeper The emotional esteem Find your lack existence is to the sea There's always help being dealt I just can't call it with the means But who we do when everything we chose to be And so I believe the yes of terror creeds Such a term is way too much for me I'm just a speck of dust that speaks and breathes Instructs and affinity sees Through interpretations of the stimuli I receive So what are the pretense that we're being unique? What makes me different to when the other human beings Nah, nothing, my G. Nah, da, nah, da. Just nothing new, nothing new. Nothing new, nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun. There's never what you do, but how it's done. You briefly mentioned college and said that you weren't going to get into that right then, but I'd love to give some space for that. Your idea on college and is that something that you feel? <laughs> you really want to go? I re- really do. You really yeah. want to go there? I really would love to. Really want to go there? Yeah, yes, yes, please. Okay, so it's real simple. You've been trained to go to college. I want them to go to college. I want them to go to college. For what? Okay, did you go to college? I did. I have to admit no, it. did you? I did. <laughs> okay, so are you doing what you studied in college? I can't say I am. Very far from it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And why, why is this? <laughs> well, don't even don't yeah. even well, <laughs> don't even answer. Okay, so it's real simple. So you're in school, right? And you go to college. Was it four years? Okay, that's already by design. So you go to college, and it's four years, and you study whatever you study, and then the debt. So now they want you to go to overgrad, undergrad, sideways grad, backwards grad. Okay, so now how many years have you put in? That's seven, eight years in college, right? And then you leave college, and where do you start? at a position that is introductory <laughs> position, an entry-level position. Why? Because all that stuff you learned eight years ago is now antiquated. Why is everywhere you go, it's a four-year university, it's a this and that, it's designed like that. You think they don't know that? Everybody can't be on the street at the same time. What are they really teaching you? What are you really doing in college? It's almost like a holding tank. That's why. And it's I can go deeper, but I I don't (laughs) I just think it's a joke, you know, with all of these studies and these papers that these college professors do and who gets to read them. You know, you got a 700 page. You studied how does leaf mulch cure cancer? You know, who gets to read that paper? Nobody. But how much money did it cost? You know, somebody spends several millions of dollars just for for you to do this paper that maybe two people are going to read. So. It's to me, it's a, it's a scam. Some things, yeah, you need college doctors or whatever. Yeah, there's certain things that do, but it's a lot of things you don't need college. And most people who've gone, they're not doing what they went to college for because they wound up realizing, I hate this. <laughs> I don't want to do this. And there's not the jobs. People, right, get, exactly. they go to college <laughs> for four years, six years. I mean, get their master's degree and they come out and they don't have jobs for what they've studied. 
I have some guys that were working with me and they went to school for it. They studied all that tech coding. They can't find a job. Even in that, and that's where everything's going to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the jobs aren't there. And then the debt is so large from college and then you can't oh my God. find the job. And again, this is another setup like you've been talking about, keeping us in the system, keeping us indebted. Um, and then I just want to touch on what you said about the college papers. I've been doing some major research into the... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, restoration industrial complex of forest ecosystems and trying to break into the forestry industry. And it's incredible because these papers on whether that's replanting of redwoods or, you know, what you said about the mulch or whatever it is, it, it doesn't even matter. But all of these papers they're not even accessible. You actually, if you're just a regular person who does want to help replant Never. a forest, yep. you can't even get to that paper or you have to spend an absorbent amount of money to buy that paper. But to even find that paper, you almost have to be in this, you know, exclusive yep. group to even know where to find it and then to find it and then you have to pay for it. And then it's written in such a way that is so... Um, honestly boring most of the time are so convoluted or so tangled up that it doesn't just allow somebody to read it and then get the information and then do the task, even if it's for something good. And so it's really fascinating how university colleges, the system, how, you know, all of those pieces actually keep us so far from being self-sufficient, from being connected to our lands are be from being connected to one another. Yep. Um, it is this yep. really massive <sighs> barrier. And <laughs> you sound exhausted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just thinking about all the papers that I've been trying to read and all the ways that just trying to break into the systems that hold so much power. And it's really, yeah, it's fascinating especially talking to you as well and you're, you're you know you're putting a flashlight on all these corners that are the barriers that are keeping the flow happening and so i yeah it brings up a lot of oof, a lot of frustration people don't think about it like that because we haven't been trained to look at it our whole thing is look through everything question everything who's benefiting where's the money where who who gets the money that's what we've been taught to value we have not been taught to value Mother Nature, you know, this planet. We have not been taught to value this planet, or it wouldn't be as trashed as it is right now. What do we value? Mm. That's how this whole system works right now. That's a change. Well, thinking about power and privilege in Los Angeles, you know, specifically, you know, we talk a lot on the show about how the burdens of this time are overwhelmingly and unrightfully placed on the backs of those who didn't create the problem in the first place. And while neighborhoods, say in South Central, are in no way responsible for regenerating the entirety of LA, there is without a doubt leadership and solutions from communities that is greatly needed to light the way forward. Yet the money and the resources are by and large held in other parts of the city. Like, you know, you we were talking earlier yeah. about the slumlords look at Los Angeles, and there's this huge, wealthy entertainment industry. So I'm wondering if you see any opportunity for harnessing or funneling the power or privilege or resources, say, from the entertainment industry, as, as an example, to support Black leadership for regenerative future in L.A. specifically. Uh, I mean, you, you can. It's highly possible, but and you have some celebrities that are doing, you know, their share, but you have some that, that's they're holding on to their purse strings really tight and don't see it as beneficial to them. Everybody should be able to breathe. There's enough food for everybody to eat. Everybody. The world's mightiest country. Why is there people dying in the street from hunger? Why is there people dying in the street from exposure? Why do we have kids in prison for life? Yes, it can be fixed. And the whole thing is a lot of people, I made this money. I'm not just giving it to you. <laughs> and again, it's because of what someone values. 
they're in a situation where they value what they have. They value their riches. They value their, their properties, their this. But until they're on their deathbed, then they see the light. Man's greed instead of man's need. What you were bringing up earlier about being self-sufficient and not relying on, let's say, a celebrity, hoping that a celebrity opens up their purse strings or values people's lives or the earth or whatever it is. Um, but instead of relying on that and just being a part of the whole nonprofit industrial complex or or basically, <laughs> I'm you glad know. You, I'm glad you <laughs> called it that. Because <laughs> a lot of nonprofits are in business to be nonprofits, period. They're not, a lot of them not changing nothing, you know. And I think it also keeps this hierarchy going as well. So it's please, please help, help. And then the nonprofits are going, please, please help, help to somebody else say, you know, somebody with power, privilege, celebrity, whatever. So there's always this chain of levels of just continuing to hope and pray and cross your fingers and beg to get somebody higher up to care or to feel that it's valuable enough or worthy enough of a cause to give money to for however long they feel like it. And right. it doesn't create self-sufficiency. It doesn't create nope. self-value. It doesn't create autonomy. It doesn't create freedom. It actually just creates the system to continue to be hierarchical. So I really am enjoying how you're talking about stop trying to get it from this other place. I, I think that's what you know, you're getting at. And so I'm interested. Totally to hear more about the self-sufficiency, more about how individuals, communities can stop using so much of their energy and their resources to try to get other people to care to then basically just give them breadcrumbs in return, if anything. <laughs> That's a big mindset that, that again, I'm going to go back to one of the first thing I said, the space that needs to be harvested is the space between our two ears. That's what's going to change it. And that's what what we do is about people. Food is a very small part of it. Yeah, we need food. But when you put yourself in a place where you understand where you are, who you are and what really matters to you. We got a world where you got people that would kill somebody over a pair of tennis shoes. Think about that. What kind of value system is that? And that's the things that has to change. And a lot of this is. A lot of this is celebrity driven. You know, what we're doing with the Ron Finley Project is I know a lot of celebrities. They're not in the standing out there with me. Says, well, why don't you get the celebrity to go do this with you? Because I didn't want this to be celebrity driven. I wanted this to be purpose driven. I want people around me to have a purpose that literally truly wants to change this, not just a name that's going to that people want to come see or you're famous. That's not what this is about. We have to change our value system. Everybody. Yeah, I think about that a lot, how this system, this current paradigm, it sets us up to value tennis shoes, diamonds, celebrity, but not value oxygen, not value clean water, not value each other, not value our neighbors. Like you were saying earlier, you, you know, we pledge allegiance to the flag. We don't pledge allegiance to even the person who lives next door to us. We don't pledge allegiance no. to the creek that <laughs> runs down a couple miles away. So it's, it, yes, this value system is so, it is the crux. It's the crux of everything. But who has thought about that? Has anybody thought about that? No, have it, no one thinks like that. And that's why like, oh, you're, you're a critical thinker. That's not critical, that's real. Cuttings on the ground, ancient angles coming down upon you. Count the pledges, fill the glass, mind the ledgers when you ask the sponsor. Smoking mirrors, firing eyes. Friends, the old cow hands are crushed.
washing cans with their new friends and everyone is showing grit and character Carolina, Ohio They don't mind if you don't know exactly how they feel about this experiment Smoking mirrors, firing eyes, everyone's got fine advice and on and on and on and on it goes. Spin the heavies, dim the lights, all hell's coming loose tonight, but it's all just part of the show. Where will you stand? Siren start to sing Out on the lookout For the damnedest thing With your garden, you know, you were speaking about your garden, the banana trees and these plants that are, that smell good, that are alluring and colorful and probably call people to them. And I'm sure as well, there's pollinators and birds and, um, and on all sorts of diversity of plants and then other creatures that come to the garden as well. And I'm wondering when people see your space, do you think that there is a value shift that starts happening when they see not just the abundance of plants, but the entire bird pollinator, fungal, you know, community that's coming together around that. Do you think that that starts to shift a value system? Of course, it shifts a value system. You realize that we're not here alone, that we, everything on this planet and the planet and everything is, is alive. Everything around you is alive. And you were saying about the plants calling you. Yes, there's, you can look at, there's videos online where people have connected electrodes to the plants and amplified the sounds that they're giving off. And every plant is given off a separate sound and it sounds like an orchestra. I, this girl did it, this demonstration in this little room of, and she wired all the plants. And there was one plant, it was giving this bass sound like, boo, boo, boo. And I'm like, what is that? She says, that's the anthurium. I'm like, no, what is the bass sound? She said, that's the plant. And this other plant was going ding, 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 ding. And that's all it did. And it was amazing. So all of this stuff together in this room, it was like the sound orchestra. So they do give off energy. Plants are alive. When you look at sunflowers, what do they try to find? The sun, where do they point to? When you get a piece of garlic and it starts growing the green out. We've been taught to throw that away. Now what you should do is put that in the ground so you can have a whole nother bulb of garlic. We're not trained like that. Plants are alive just like the earth is alive. Like water. Water is alive. We don't, but we think we turn on the faucet and it come on, but we don't treat it like it's this element. It's alive. That's why it, it will mildew. That's why it will stink because it's alive. It's like food. Food that doesn't mildew <laughs> that doesn't you know that doesn't get mold on it we got a problem you got a problem so yeah it does it does change people's consciousness all of a sudden i haven't seen a dragonfly in 20 years and you know and stuff like that i have birds that literally to come to my garden that i've never seen in my life in south central it really also shows the resiliency of mother nature and it's a domino effect when you start to tend the land the birds, the bees, the dragonflies, all these incredible creatures, they're probably sensing your uh, energetic orchestra. They do. Of you, of your land, of how you're you're putting so much care into it and how the community grows. And I feel it's such an amazing lesson to take a moment and be allured in to then see, oh, wow, this is... And I think it also, I know for me, it helps me see that there is such a bigger, much bigger system going on than even the system that is trying to control us all. 
there's a much, much bigger. Uh, you said trying to control us all. Let, we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll take out the trying. With... We can erase the trying <laughs> part from that. <laughs> Just, yeah, controlling us all. It's I'm honestly really imagining what your garden must look like and how people like you said, people just walking down the street and smiling when they see a sunflower. I mean, these are really powerful acts that because we don't value them and because we're so infiltrated by commercials, social media, it it takes us away from that power. So I, I, I love all that you've been sharing with us. And I know that you're really busy on the road. And so perhaps we can wrap up the conversation with just if you could share with us, you know, What's the next year look like for you? How can people get involved? What kind of support are you calling in for your projects? And yeah, how can people learn more? They can go on our website with the function, which is happening June the 30th at Vermont Square Park. It's just a fun field way that we show people how to have fun with very little effort and it's free for the whole community. And there's everything from circus training to weaving to we have people who make pottery and jump rope and tug of war and dancing and live groups. And we had someone last year that you get to make your own facial care products. So it's just a fun thing. You know, and one of the one you made me think of one of the things recently, I have a neighbor down the street and her daughters, they I have this this hut, a twig hut, they call it, that's been built on the street, right on the street. And they come, you know, they used to come in and play with their dolls and different things. And then all of a sudden, I noticed all my blackberries would be missing. And they would, they, so they, they would come early and eat all my blackberries. But I, just last week, they came by and they, they brought a friend and they just ran and started eating nasturtiums out of the garden. And I asked her, I said, what have you created? She says, I didn't do this, you did. <laughs> you know, and it made me think all of a sudden that the, I got these young girls that are running to the garden to eat flowers out of the garden. So yeah, it, it's, it could happen. Again, it goes back beauty in, beauty out. I literally get to see a change that uh, I've had a hand in making and it, and I'm honored by that. Well, thank you, Ron. I'm honored to have had this conversation with you today and all of the places you went with us and really <laughs> helping. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I love it. I love it because like you said, we got to get between the ears. We have to shake each other up to shake off the conditioning so that we can start to see clearly and start to value clearly. And we need people like you who can crack and find the fissures in our, yeah, in our conditioning to break it. And so I really, yeah. I loved it. I loved being able to talk about college and the prison industrial complex and the nonprofit industrial complex and food growing. And, and I really loved hearing from you how it isn't for you about farming or growing other people's food. It's, it is, yes, growing your own food, but it's about the the self-actualized sustainability of, of one oneself to have the skills to grow the confidence to value oneself, to value one's own skills for self-sufficiency, that is huge. That that really is a is something that isn't talked about because it's been so overshadowed by celebrity, consumerism, alcohol, on and on and on, like all the things you've talked about. So I, I just really appreciate everywhere you went. I appreciate you giving me the time to um, have this conversation with you.
Thank you for listening to For the Wild Podcast. I'm Ayana Young. The music you heard today was by Paul DeFiglia and then Jack Bushman and Ben Chase. I'd like to thank our incredible team, our producer and editor, Andrew Storrs, research director, Madison Mogolski, media director, Molly Lebov, and research assistant, Francesca Glassbell. Thanks for listening and supporting For the Wild. The sounds of people talking, words of blue and gray, smells of doors and windows, closed against the day, the sweet smell of the pines, tall western cedar, drifting all the way.